That's good to hear. That's Hang good to out. hear. Fantastic. Good. Good. Well, it is um, it is noon Eastern. So without further ado, then we'll just go ahead and uh, and jump right in. And first, welcome, welcome all of you. As as uh, our distinguished speaker was saying, it's wonderful to have so many interested folks from all around the world joining us virtually. That is definitely a silver lining. And I think we're all in need of as many silver linings as possible these days. Um, for those of you who don't know me, perhaps I'm Scott Shackelford. I have the honor and the privilege of being the executive director of the Ostrom Workshop. Um, here at Indiana University. And we're thrilled today to help launch uh, World Commons Week in collaboration with the International Association for the Study of the Commons, which of course Lynn Ostrom helped to uh, found and which is still you know, headquartered actually in Bloomington. And uh, we're doing that today with a, a, a man who really needs no introduction, particularly to this audience, but we'll give him one anyway and butcher his incredibly impressive CV. Um, so our OSHA Memorial Lecturer today is uh, Professor Frank Lairhoven. The Oyster Memorial uh, Lecture itself was established uh, back in 2015 by our former director, uh, Lee Alston, to, to celebrate the legacy of the Ostroms. And we've had a number of incredible speakers over the years since, including uh, Barry Weingast and Margaret Levy and Milton Mueller and many others. Uh, but Frank, I feel like you're in a league of your own in so many ways. Um, and you're very uniquely positioned to help kind of reflect on Frankly, the last 30 years since Lynn's seminal volume, uh, Governing the Commons, was published. And as just a reminder on that, um, Frank is kicking off this discussion today with Governing the Commons, you know, 30 years later, an inventory of good advice for commoners. But remember, the conversation will be ongoing um, all tomorrow morning, Eastern, thanks to the wonderfully um, uh, diligent and hard work by Edu Brandizio um, and Bill Blomquist and our wonderful staff and so many others who pulled together this Governing the Commons 30 Years Later conference. So do remember, you have to register for that separately if you haven't already. We'll put the link in the window. Um, and shortly, it's, it's been fantastic because we've already had, if I'm not mistaken, David, more than 1,200 registrations for this event. So we couldn't be more thrilled with that. It's going to be a star-studded lineup. Um, and we're, we're very excited to get that conversation started today, though. Um, so, Frank, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, is a former student um, of Lynn's who's been doing lots of groundbreaking work in this field, looking at environmental governance, uh, particularly the governance of ecosystems, uh, management of common pool resources and social ecological systems, as well as local democracy and decentralized reform efforts. He has a PhD in public policy um, from IU and has worked around the world, um, including for the, uh, for the UN Food and Agriculture Organization in Senegal and Chile uh, before joining the faculty as an associate professor um, of geosciences and working on a lot of cutting edge issues and sustainability as well. So uh, Frank, we are just thrilled uh, to be able to host you at least virtually. Again, we're very sorry I couldn't be in person um, today for this uh, incredibly important and timely talk. I can think of no one better um, able to give it and thank you so much again for joining us. And over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Scott, for this uh, lovely introduction. And if only uh, half of the accolades were actually deserved by me, I'd be a happy man. And what a tremendous honor, uh, uh, an honor that I'm sure uh, that I am not uh, fully worthy of. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Um, cool. So I hope you can see the first slide. And so, yeah, so this is my uh, Ostrom Memorial Lecture. And at the same time, um, I'm also delivering North America's contribution to the IS, IASC's regional keynote webinars that are a part of this year's World Commons Week. And that part uh, representing North America, that is, uh, scares me as well. Rumor has it that uh, debates in certain parts of uh, North America, in the US in particular, can get pretty rowdy and chaotic. And I can only hope that uh, you won't interrupt and start yelling at me too much. I especially salute and encourage my friends in the USA as they are suffocated by the putrid stench of sulfur, burning wood and tear gas. Uh, take heart. So part of my unease today uh, is also related with the occasion of this talk. So we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Eleanor Ostrom's book, Governing the Commons. And somehow to me, 
gathering in great numbers to revere a person and a book seems at odds with the sound uh, practice of science. But I guess that governing the commons is not just another book and that Eleanor or Lynn, as most of you would call her, Ostrom was an extraordinary person. So as long as you promise that this won't turn into a dogmatic event gearing around the question, what would Lynn have done? I'll allow you to continue this lecture series for, let's say, another 20 years or so. But then it has to stop, really. Um, for me, uh, governing the commons has always represented a uniquely well-working account of down-to-earth case descriptions and analysis on the one hand, and elegant, sophisticated theory building on the other. So the icing on the cake consists of what I feel like is a very practical set of rules of thumb, the design principles that is, that I have always imagined uh, non-academic real world commoners can actually work with, kind of. And for me, the book shows how I think science is to be done. The case studies uh, are presented in an attempt to provide ex post understanding of what happened in all of these cases and why, with the purpose of ultimately building theory that has the ambition to engage in ex ante prediction and the latter without falling prey to the pitfall of simplicity, but stressing complexity instead, and without formulating flawed blanket solutions or panacea but stressing the importance of context and time and place particularities instead. So peel down to its bare basics, I guess science needs to be scientifically as well as societally relevant. So the quest uh, of academia is, I think, to build theory and to solve problems. And these two goals, of course, go hand in hand and, and, and very intimately so. So I, I have an audience that, that probably ranges from distinguished and established veterans to early career up and coming scholars and eager grad students and hopefully some practitioners as well. And I would like to seize upon the opportunity and learn about what our community is up to, in your view that is. So could you please go to the website that is called menti.com and enter the code that is provided at the top of this slide. It is 7772384. And people are already casting votes. votes. That's, that's good. So, um, so I want you to cast uh, your answer and not the socially accepted uh, answer, of course, but the real answer. And realize that it's, uh, that it's uh, anonymous what you're doing. So do you do casework? or other types of analyses that is used as a vehicle with the ultimate goal of contributing to the generation of, and testing of, of theory? Or do you see it as ultimately contributing to the development of methods maybe? Or are you seeing your current work as a means to primarily help commoners in general or in a particular setting to solve the problems that they are, se se that they are uh, facing? So I see that we have quite a, a couple of votes and you can see how things are balancing out. We have a relatively large group that sees themselves focusing on theory building. And luckily I'm glad to see that many perceive of their current work as contributing to the solving of problems in context. So this, is, this is nice. We have a number of votes, I think. Yeah, so we get the picture. I hope you can see the slide as well, so please. Keep your browser open because there will be a couple more of these kinds of questions so we can look at the outcome and, and, and learn about what our community is and what it sees as, uh, as doing. So this is how things are balancing out, at least in the audience that I'm talking to today. So in my other talk last week at the workshop, I talked about what I call the horror of the age index. And I think that has us succumbing to a perverse incentive to publish more rather than better papers. And that horror of the age index and all the incentive structure around us, it 
uh, places a premium on theory rather than on the, on, the, on, the, on the solving of societal problems. So you can find that talk on the workshop, uh, workshop's uh, YouTube channel if you are interested. So I had imagined that there is proportionally more work on theory going on than on the solving of societal problems in our, uh, in our, in our domain. So let's go back to the book that we are celebrating today. So at the surface, uh, the puzzle that lies at the heart of governing the commons doesn't appear to be all that complex, I find. So how can groups of people best govern their shared resource sustainably? And this seemingly simple question contrasts rather sharply with the enormous amount of energy that has been poured into answering it since 1990, the year that the book appeared. I think it is even hard to imagine uh, a book that has prompted more scientific endeavor than governing the common. In the last 30 years, countless careers, and, and, and mine included, uh, have been built on it, and many libraries have been filled and, and, and studies uh, have been filled with studies that spun off the book. If and to what extent have these combined efforts led to the formulation of real world solutions to real world problems? Uh, experienced by real world people. So already 30 years ago in the book that we are discussing today, Ostrom proposed her famous design principles, eight in total. And since then, many people seem to have convincingly confirmed the solidity of these principles. I think of the work of uh, Michael Cox and his colleagues, for example, who added some tweaks here and there, but basically confirmed uh, the validity of the of the principles and people have, la have, have, have lately started to furthering ideas based on the design pr principles and I'm thinking of the work of Jacobo Paggio and his his colleagues who are looking into uh, the importance of how principles configure but how has the research that was triggered by governing the commons the book helped commoners to make better decisions how can we proceed to further improve our service to the people for whom we are doing this? So what, what triggered my thinking about my talk today was an email that I got from uh, before the summer from Christophe Leue from the organization called Om et Terre. Uh, and that's an organization that works on reforestation in West Africa. And, and Christoph has a lot of sympathy for the work of Ostrom and he feels that his organization's approach mirrors the work of Ostrom. Uh, and interestingly, by the way, the organization's approach was not designed with Ostrom's work in mind. It was only after reading Ostrom, Ostrom's work that, that Christoph realized that his approach was in strong congruence with, uh, with the design principles. So he contacted me to inquire about the possibility of uh, training his people on the ground. So his staff consists of mostly young professionals without a college education. And commons jargon that I'm used to using will be wasted on them. Christoph wanted to get them trained on what to do and how to do it. And when I got the question, I panicked. After working well over 20 years on the commons, I know a thing or, or two about polycentricity, about complex adaptive uh, systems, about graduated sanctions and nested enterprises, about the differences between designing and crafting institutions. And I pride myself for having marginally contributed to the fine tuning of some of those analytical concepts that we as a community use. But I could in no way envision myself teaching practitioners how to go about to, for example, create a viable conflict resolution mechanism or to help communities to put in place inclusive forms of decision making that align with local circumstances. And soon Christoph stopped answering my emails, which is totally understandable. I had nothing to offer to him and that made me sad. So now I am asking you to, uh, to, to go to Menti again and, and ans answer the following question. Do you feel that you would have been able to give a training like this. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if you have the same type of panic, if you'd be confronted with a question like this. Yeah, most people are 
some people are confident that they could do it. So, so I, I'm really wondering who, who, who these people are. Maybe, maybe these are the practitioners that know a thing or two more about real life than, than the academics in the ivory tower do. Most people are semi-confident that eventually they, they'd be able to do it. Uh, yeah, quite a few people also at the left-hand side of my slide that, that would say, no way, never, I could do that. Great, so I, I, I get an I, this this is comforting for me. So I'm not the only one who have who, who have these these these, these feelings of, of of panic when confronted with a with a, with a simple seemingly simple question uh, like this. So now now continue with the with the with the with the next uh, question. Uh, even if you don't see yourself giving a training like this, do you think uh, you could then at least assign part of your work your your writing? As, as a reading or could could your readings or your work be used in some way or the other to develop a training like that that's that's a question that i'm interested in so, so you you have published you think about publishing you, you you are an academic is the kind of work the things that you're sharing contributing to putting together a training like this and i'm i'm lucky to see that many people do see their work as possibly or definitely contributing to to these kinds of trainings on the ground trainings helping practitioners helping commoners and the supporters of 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 uh, of, of, uh, of commoners yeah so this is a good turnout we have 84 votes being casted fantastic 89 there is still a few to come. Great. So I, I hope you can you can you can see the slide and, and 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 know who you are and how you look at your own work and how practical you think it is. So I'm very glad to see that many of you think of their work as 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 contributing to to practice. Um. So as 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 hell is is right around the corner, and it is one minute to twelve. It is urgent that our community of commons practitioners and scholars take the task of helping people to solve their commons problem more serious than ever before. Upon realizing that I wouldn't be able to design and give that training that Christoph was asking for, it dawned upon me that I was sitting on top of a wealth worth of work that our community has been building because for well over 10 years, yep, I have been the editor of uh, the International Journal of the Commons. If you don't know it, you should definitely look it up. I'm doing that together with Michael Schoon and, and Sergio Villamayor. The IJC, as we call it by its acronym, was founded by Tina de Moor and uh, Erling Berge. It was launched in, uh, in, in 2007 uh, with an issue that I was the guest editor of. So it's already that long that I've been involved. I guest edited that first issue together with Lynn. And ever since, the journal has accumulated uh, hundreds of publications, and I like to see it as the prime platform for common scholarship. But I am a little bit biased, of course. I had never looked at our journal's content in this particular form uh, before, but would I be able, I ask myself, to derive an inventory of good advice for commoners and their supporters from all the cutting edge work that we have helped publishing over the years with a stamp of approval from peer reviewers uh, from our community and beyond. That was the question that, that I was asking myself. So in, in, in other words, would I be able to write governing your comments, an owner's manual? And, and the precise placement of the apostrophe is, uh, in, in owners is crucial as you will realize. So this was my, my goal. So what I did, I, I proceeded to download uh, the data corresponding with 298 articles that were published since 2011, which is the year when IJC was admitted to Scopus, an indexing service. And here is a word cloud that resulted from inserting all the keywords that authors themselves assigned to their papers and, ac and action jumps out and that's that that was a promising start of course action it's all about action although i think that this action is also tied to the concept of collective action but it looked promising action so i then took um, a random sample 
of 75 titles corresponding with 25% of the total number of articles that we have published since uh, 2011. I checked and decided that the sample was sufficiently representative, as you can see here, if you give it a quick look. And then I spent a fair amount of time uh, reading these uh, 75 articles. Well, not really reading, but reading the abstract, reading the introduction and reading the conclusion chapters because I trust our peer review process. I felt that I could skip the literature, the methods and the results section. And I did that in order to identify the paper's objective, the findings and the recommendations. That was what I was looking for. Uh, and, and while at it, I registered the type of comments, if applicable. And here's a word cloud that I guess shows a lot of the usual suspects. So the larger the font, the more often it is, uh, it is, it is mentioned. I, I'm curious, and, and I, I would like to ask you what your favorite type of comments is. So what type of comments, if, if applicable, have you worked on uh, on the most? So maybe you can go to Menti again, if you're still on the, on the website and, uh, and, and quickly submit your, uh, your answer. All right, it's nicely uh, spreading out. Not a lot of irrigation I can see for now, which is curious. In our journal, we have quite a lot of contributions that are related with irrigation. See forests, water, and, and, and of course the, the denominations are not very, very, very uh, finely uh, defined, but still you can get a gist. So this gives me an impression of, uh, of who you are and what you do. What, and and it, it, if, if I'm assuming that you're representative of our, of our community, it also gives me a good overview of where we stand. So great, thank you for sharing that. So this is a, a cloud, a word cloud that gives a course overview of the whereabouts of the cases that were presented in the papers that I had included in my sample. Again, the larger the font, the more often the country uh, was mentioned. And I'm asking you while I'm at it, what, 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 what are the countries where you have done most of your case uh, work? I think you can enter up to three answers. So you can type it and submit it. And there should be a word cloud uh, yeah, we have, yeah, it's working. Brazil, Russia, US, USA, Peru, China. Not sure what's happening. It's loading. Um, this is not working well, so as soon as, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to skip this one in order to avoid a delay. Um, so you remember this slide, eh? so scholars can focus on, on the building of theory, the development of methods, on the solving of general, and the solving of particular uh, problems. That's how I have envisioned the, 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 the scholarly endeavor in, in very general terms. And I have used this as a, as a departure point for my coding activities. So the first thing that I coded regarded the expressed uh, ambition in the article. What were the objectives and what were the research questions? So here is what I found with regard to our community's take on theory building. So 28% does not seem to have an explicit ambition to add to theory building. Uh, 29%, uh, for 29%, the main ambition uh, of the study is not to build theory, but theoretical advances may have resulted from case studies as a byproduct, so to say, or theoretical understanding may have resulted from a descriptive study. And for 43%, the advancement of theory appears to have been the main objective of their effort. So these numbers do not quite coincide with, your, uh, with, your, uh, with the votes that you have casted. So, the, so in, these, uh, in, these, uh, in these articles that, uh, that, that, that aim primarily at the building of theory, a case study or a set of case study may have been used as a vehicle to, 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 do, just, uh, to do just that. Um, apparently, very few authors have the explicit wish to primarily contribute to development of, of, of methods, as you can see here. Um, the majority of our authors do not express 
um, an explicit ambition to solve practical problems that are generally experienced by commoners and their uh, their supporters, as you can see here. And with regards to particular problems or practical problems in context, I find that almost half of the publications, 47%, express no explicit ambition to solve practical problems that, are, that commoners and their supporters are experiencing in a particular setting. So besides coding the types of objectives and research questions in order to get a sense of the ambitions of the order, I looked up their explicit recommendation. And if present, those were mostly expressed in one form or the other towards the end of the respective papers. So an explicit recommendation turned out to be absent in a third of all cases that I uh, went through. Another third of the articles has recommendations that are primarily aiming at the solving of general problems in the commons and theory and or methods may have been employed to structure the search for solutions, but the development of theory and methods is not what the study is primarily after. At least that's how I have coded these cases. In 16% of the cases, as you can see uh, in my sample, the main recommendation regards theoretical development. A case study uh, may have been used, again, as a vehicle to test or to generate theory, but the main recommendation does not regard that case, but regards the general theoretical claim instead. And honestly, before starting this coding exercise, I had expected this number to be much higher. So I was pleasantly surprised. I, 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 I do not uh, underestimate the importance of theory building, but I, I am really liking the more practical work and the solution of, uh, of problems in context. So I also looked up who, who was addressed in these recommendations. And maybe this is one of the more sobering results. So when giving recommendations, we hardly ever seem to address commoners. So an implication of our results for policy, that is a sentence that pops off very often at the end of the article. So policy makers, whomever they are, are generically addressed when we formulate our recommendation. Um, the, the recommendations, they vary in their respective level of specificness. So many of these recommendations are very general. Uh, and you must think of a recommendation like, for example, more attention should be given to the inclusive decision-making procedures. And so of the 23 articles in my sample that I coded as expressing a main ambition to solve general type common problems, very few converted their, their result in a recommendation for commoners. And most of them addressed policymakers instead. And on top of that, the recommendations that were gearing at commoners were never ever very specific, according to my coding effort. For the 12 articles that I coded as expressing a main ambition to solve problems in context, so not general, but, uh, but, uh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, so, it, so in this slide, it seems that the, the picture looks a little bit more rosier for common, commoners, but the absolute number is, uh, of, of papers offering very specific advice to commoners is still very low, of course. So in the end, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to accommodate the people in this audience that were triggered by the title of the talk. And then my title had to be provided uh, uh, long before I did this actual analysis. So I'm not going to give advice to commoners, but I think that I can give advice to common scholars instead. So 30 years ago, Lynn Ostrom taught us about the importance of what she called the design principles. And today I can still not tell you in great detail or in what way uh, that can be done meaningfully by you. Uh, what to do, how to go about. I cannot tell you how to act, how to, how to, uh, how to, uh, to get your act together with regard to boundaries and inclusive decision making and monitoring and sanctioning and all, all that good stuff. Um, so. Uh, 
Oh yeah. So the impression that, that I'm now sharing with you is not only the outcome of the exercise that I have presented you, uh, you with here. It is also based on my uh, own work with uh, Claire Barnes on what it is that NGOs can do to help commoners to solve the problems that they are facing. And there is too little time to go into the details of this work, but I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that you, you look this up if you are interested in it. So in the end, what, what can I offer you? What can I myself recommend to have common scholarship culminating in, in more and better recommendation for commoners? So you remember this slide, and I have now added something in, in, the, in the middle with the exclamation mark. So we are used to looking backwards, that is in our casework, we are using that as natural or quasi experiments. We try to retroactively explain why things panned out as they did. Um, and if that explanation appears to hold water, it helps us to generate theory and theory in turns in turn is ultimately used for forward looking endeavors in an attempt to test theory. So the spot that I have now added to this graph represents the here and the now. It represents not caring so much for ex post understanding or ex ante prediction, but about solving problems right here and right now. So my, my, my Fitbit, I'm, oh, I'm not wearing it, it's, uh, it's, uh, the battery is loading, but my Fitbit keeps telling me uh, these days that I should consider uh, practicing mindfulness. And I warn you, I don't practice mindfulness. I don't know what it is really, but I Googled it and I think it's about a focus on the here and the now. So, so, so maybe it's my recommendation to invest in mindful science. If I were to quote the specifics of this recommendation, uh, as I did with the articles, I would definitely quote this as very vague and abstract. So let me specify my argument in a bit more detail, if you, if you don't mind. So first, I am in favor of more research that is embedded in a larger research uptake strategy. In my recent research projects in Bangladesh, I have structured all work and activities around the scheme that you are looking at uh, on your uh, screen. The approach distinguishes between and integrates activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. Uh, research, also virtually all the research that I've seen uh, being published in the International Journal of the Commons, commonly gets stuck somewhere at the bottom of this scheme. So what you do is you employ research activities, data is extracted from respondents, you, your data gathering is informed by your understanding of Ostrom. You use the IAD, the SES framework. You have indicators that you help, that you, that you hope will, will, will help you measuring your variables that are based on the design principles, for example. Data is then analyzed, is convert, ver, converted into a paper, publication, or research project outputs are pumped out. That, of course, is good for your resume. You get more research grants as a result, and everything starts all over again. There is an endless cycle of pumping out papers that are good for governing your career advancements, but not so good for governing the commons, maybe. So the ultimate goal of research uh, should, however, always be to have an impact on the commons. And in order to do that, output, so your papers, your models, your tools, must be converted in what are called outcomes. That is, you will want relevant stakeholders, uh, commoners and supporters of the commons to become aware of your outputs and start using these outputs. That is, you will, uh, you will uh, want... Uh, no. So in, in, in order to achieve that, apologies for that, you must let go of the idea that your publication is the end station of your project. After all, your stakeholders will not read them. Because first of all, they're stored behind insurmountable paywalls if you're not in academia. And secondly, because there isn't that much in it for them anyway, as I have just shown you in my coding exercise. 
So what you need is a research uptake strategy that includes and has you engaging with stakeholders, for example, commoners, from the very beginning. And apart from engaging with stakeholders, uh, you should think about capacity building, about communication that goes far beyond the publications of paper in, papers in peer-reviewed high-impact journals. You should think about continuous monitoring and ev evaluation and learning. And under this scenario, commoners are not used for the extraction of data for your benefit. They're not asked to fill out surveys that are informed by your preconceived theoretical ideas. Genuinely engaging with them, asking them what matters to them, may or may not have you drifting away from much or maybe even everything that you have read in Governing the Commons. So you can check out the website of one of the projects that I coordinate uh, and that we have tried to organize around this, uh, this, this principle. The project is called Delta Mar. So building on this idea, I would also like to see more experiments in our domain with participatory action research and everything that, that, that hoovers around that concept that has you as a researcher working with or for commoners and their supporters. So going over what participatory action research is or could mean for common study is too much for just one slide, but what it would boil down to is that it would have researchers, yourself, engaging with commoners, not as subjects, but as co-researchers. So you, the researcher, wouldn't enter the picture with a preconceived problem perception, for example, a perception that was informed by your reading of governing the commons, regardless of how extraordinary, brilliant and outstanding you may find that book. And I agree, it is all these things. But you would, together with commoners, diagnose a situation, decide on alternative courses of action. You would plan action, take action, evaluate the consequences, learn from what happened and start over again. And thanks to the work of uh, Jetske Vaas and, and Model on Eldering uh, that you see on this slide, I have started to dip a toe in the water of uh, participatory action research as well. And you should maybe check out this work and maybe get as excited as I'm uh, beginning to be. After having talked about the nature and the quality of the recommendations of others, I, of course, have to leave you with my own set of recommendations. So here they are. So keep doing what you're doing. I'm, I'm not saying that you should, should stop doing what you're doing. Stop generating theory, testing theory. You're great at it. I would say that it's needed to formulate clear and precise recommendations always. Oftentimes I have failed to find recommendations where I was sure that based on the research outcomes that they, they could have been formulated. And often I have seen recommendations that were clearly not related with the outcomes of the research. Avoid doing that. I would say specify whom you are addressing. Reveal who your message is meant for. Go beyond the obligatory, the policy implication of my findings are the following. Be precise. I would invite you and advise you to address and accommodate commoners and their support much more often. I would even like to see them as co-authors uh, more often. Try to solve practical problems minimally as much as you tried to build theory. And try out what I've called mindful science approaches or whatever you want to call them. I'm sure that this term won't stick, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, try research uptake strategies and participatory action research, but also transdisciplinary research or scenario-based imaginaries and, and things like that. There's a wide range of approaches that I feel falls under this umbrella. Um, yeah, I'm not doing this because this slide is not working. That's too bad. So that means that this is all that I have prepared for you. So I thank you for your attention. and. I am, by the way, going to put my mouth where my money is. I'm, I'm going to set aside part of the remuneration that I'm getting for this talk to stimulate the publication of common scholarship in our journal that is based on the kinds of approaches that I have championed in this talk. And that can be done through the offering of discounts 
of waivers, through inviting invitations, or through extra editorial help to non-academic authors who are less familiar with our peculiar way of, uh, of presenting publishable uh, results. And, and if ap applicable, don't forget to vote next month. That was all, guys. Thank you so much, Frank. So first off, I know everyone's joining me virtually in a round of applause, because <laughs> that was fantastic. I'm glad the technology worked for the most part. That was, it was really interactive and helpful. Um, and as you can see in the chat box there, the kudos are, are already flooding in. We, we already have several questions uh, popping up in our Q&A. So I'm not sure if you can pull that up as well. Um, but a really easy one to start with, Frank, is just a copy of your slides. We'll, of course, of course have those up um, on the workshop site. But if, if it's already online, if you have a URL, we can put that in the chat box immediately. Otherwise, we'll get them uploaded to, um, to the workshop site um, later today, guys. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be totally willing to share what I just presented. Right. I'm, I, I'm probably not able to to send it to you right away. I'm, yeah, I'm, not, so no. I'm not so savvy. Thank you, no, Elias. No, no worries at all. We will, we will get that up, everybody, um, shortly. <laughs> so we'll, we'll put it right next to uh, Frank's talk on the OSHA Memorial Lecture page. Okay. Um, and then I'm not sure if you can see Michael or Chris's uh, questions, but I'm happy to look at those. Uh, so Michael's question to kind of start us off, um, Frank, was a question about the issue of acquiring the commons. And his question in particular is, when the majority of Earth's resources are controlled by uh, privateers, what are commoners uh, to do in order to have um, a say in the resources and their, and their governance? Perhaps, oh, here we go, a crypto common bond secured by the common capital assets acquired by bond proceeds. So here we go. So now we're going in the realm of kind of blockchain um, and different you know, technological techniques um, to you know, parse out ownership and perhaps even global common pool resources. I'm not sure if you've thought much about that, Frank, but you're welcome to respond if you'd like. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend that I'm able to answer this question. I haven't thought about this at all. So, so I'm sorry, I'm not the person to answer that, 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 that particular question. I'm, I'm very sorry, Michael. Oh, not at all. No, not at all. Yeah, for what it's worth, guys, at the very end of um, a book called Governing New Frontiers in the Information Age that I just published earlier this year, there is a short section on the utility of blockchain in this context, including a global commons coin idea. So, Michael, I'm happy to talk with you more about that. There is a small group kind of working on some of those issues. Definitely not a panacea. Huge problems with it, but it could yeah. be some, you know, potential, um, you know, have some potential there. Chris, though, was kind of talking about um, how many papers in the International Journal of the Commons would you say were transdisciplinary, involving commoners and policymakers in the process of uh, research shaping their approach and the outcome? So is that is that kind of par for the course, would you say, Frank, or is that still more unique to have that combination? Um, yeah, hi, Chris. Uh, great question. And and unfortunately, the question is that it's uh, that it's limited to something close to zero. I cannot think from the top of my mind of a contribution like that, although maybe there are some authors listening in who would say, no, my paper was definitely transdisciplinary. So I'm apologizing if I haven't picked up on that. But I, I, I don't. So across the board, I, I, I don't see it enough to my liking. I would like to to see lots of transdisciplinary participatory action research uh, approaches that see the publication as the starting point rather than the end point of what you do as a scholar. Um, yeah, while I'm, 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 I'm babbling, I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, of examples in our journal that are based on transdisciplinarity, but nothing comes to mind, Chris, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry that there aren't many examples. So, so, so please, if you feel if, if, if you feel I'm talking to you, let, let, let this stuff come in, contact me and, and, and see how we can uh, work on that. Absolutely, and it underscores your central point, right? That's kind of a call to action. To, to yeah, a call to action, that's the word, so. Yes, and, and please guys, feel free to keep using the Q&A feature here. I saw George um, Osterhold had a question as well about whether or not you feel, Frank, like researchers might suffer from some sort of, um, he calls it imposter syndrome, but that's kind of the mm -hmm. idea of not being comfortable necessarily putting themselves in kind of wearing the policymaker hat, right? Um, yeah. Might this be a reason that there's a shortage of actionable recommendations to commoners? So I'm wondering, you know, if both do you feel that and maybe what ways would you suggest to even address that? Perhaps in getting some firsthand experience during a leave or sabbatical, trying to, you know, develop policy in some uh, vein. So any reflections there would be most welcome to. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. I, I definitely suffer from an imposter syndrome, or it's it's more than a syndrome. It's, I'm I'm just an imposter. Um, that's that's a joke, right? Of course, I'm a serious scholar. Um, but yes, maybe we we tend to hide behind complex uh, theory. I, th I think the, the the solution, the call that I was making. So if 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 your recommendations and solution are the result of a close collaboration with commoners and their supporters, there is nothing to be afraid about. I mean, if this is how they see that their problems can be solved, and if you have helped them putting things to the test, if there is some form of rigidity in the uh, in, 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 in analyzing and testing things and, and iteratively, iteratively building on, on, on furthering, there is nothing to to be afraid, you can share that. So, so, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, uh, to, 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 to tell many of my colleagues that they are suffering from an imposter syndrome. Um, yeah, much interested in in policy science interfaces. So it's not the sheer brilliance of a of, of a recommendation or an analysis that will have policymakers cave and say, oh, I haven't never right. thought about that. Then of course I will do as Frank says. That's not how policy making works, of course. So, so look into that literature of policy science interfaces and stuff. Not sure if this answers your question. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. And that's one thing we're trying to do at the workshop is to do more of a policy lab format with some of the clinics and other ideas. Because as you said, yeah. Frank, historically, it's wonderful. I, and I completely agree to have this type of applied element to be integral to what we do. Um, and Vicky was also asking a question about, especially for the practitioners out there who aren't you know, um, maybe core scholars in this arena, how can you also make a difference, right? If you value um, the commons and, uh, and protecting it, are there, are there various ways to get involved that you recommend, um, Frank, in terms of this more, you know, civil society uh, uh, level, as opposed to kind of publishing directly? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently very much convinced about, uh, about the, 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 the research impact strategies. And luckily in the Netherlands, and I'm not sure how, how things are in, uh, in other parts of the world, financers or funders are interested in these models as well. They are looking far beyond the sheer need of scholars to publish and they, they, they do accommodate and they push for. So the fact that I'm doing this in Bangladesh, the example that I gave is not because I, I thought of that and I thought that that would be a good, I, I was actually asked by my, uh, by my funder to, to, to mold my application in, in these terms and I have grown to like it. And so I, uh, in your introduction, you, you, you told people that I worked for the UN, for the Food and Agricultural Organization. I was a practitioner of sort in, in a previous life, and now I'm in academia, and I'm somewhat in a split. I never feel quite comfortable on either side. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that, that this, this, this research impact strategy approach where you, where you engage with stakeholders and you, you venture away from your preconceived theoretical ideas because you're in constant dialogue with the people for whom you are presumably doing this. It's comforting. It's, 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 uh, it's satisfying. So I think that's, yeah, look, I'm not sure how NSF looks at this. Are, are, is NSF funding research that is supposed to, <laughs> to result in data analysis and publication, or do they look far beyond that? And do they have ideas about stimulating the impact or stimulating an increased impact of research? So, so how, how, I'm not sure how the American markets... Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even some foundations are doing some more innovative you know, uh, funding in this context, and they value more, frankly, the practical edge. Lisa, I like your comment about yep. uh, academics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us um, that resonates, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not a typo. I had to, I had to look twice. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Yeah. Um, and there, and there's a lot of other great, you know, uh, comments and questions kind of flooding in here. So we'll take as many as we have time for. Um, so, uh, you know, Sola Kim, for example, so it looks like she's a perspective, uh, a PhD student here. She's researching. Um, a uh, oh in Korea, looking to see about water conflict in particular in Korea, and the issue that uh, that they're kind of uh, looking at is commoners not fully recognizing the problems and causes of any kind of water conflict on the Korean Peninsula, and the question in particular is you know how do we get over this stalemate? So um, and the suggestion there is well maybe we should just have them read governing the commons right. <laughs> That would be nice, right? 
That would be nice. Well, but... to be honest, and I'm I'm sorry if I'm going to offend you, uh, so oh, no. but I mean that's that's the opposite of what I'm saying. So I, I'm not, so commoners are not failing because they fail to recognize the problems and causes as we frame them and as as Lynn has framed them in her path-breaking book. I mean, they have good reasons for see their reality as they they see them. If they, uh, I think I think rather than 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 imposing them. With, with with our view of problems and causes, uh, we should listen to them and, and ask them, why is it that you, what is your dialogue in contestation? And yeah, so I, so I don't think that, uh, that the proposition that, uh, that Sola is sharing is, is, is along the way that I was proposing. No, that's fair. So, so, so listening to their view, their framing, their perceived uh, conception of their situation and, and the probable causes, and not telling them what they're. I think one of the the, the, the ironic titles of one of the papers that Jeske Vaas uh, and I, it was Jeske's idea, is uh, was let us tell you what your problems are. That was the the, the ironic undertone of uh, the title of one of the papers that we have published. Of course, we are not going to tell people what their problems are. Mm. Uh, we have to listen to them telling us what they think their problems are and what the causes of these problems are in order to, 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 to further the possible solution of these problems. Which is, why the, why, which is why the dogmatic embracing for 30 years of a book like Governing the Commons is, is, is a bit uncomfortable to me. That was the provocative start of my, my talk. Should we, should we always rely on, on that book and, and tell people, read it and you will understand and your problems will be solved? I mean, we, we, we should, further incrementally or dramatically or drastically uh, our understanding. So that, that, was, that was part of my message. At least that's what I intended to be part of my message. Oh no, and it's, it's very well taken. No, th thank, thank you, Frank. And there's, again, there's so many of these guys. Um, so yeah, thank you, James, uh, James Farmer for some other journal suggestions that publish this type of interdisciplinary work as well. Um, jet ski, this is kind of a fun question, Frank. So let's, let's give you unlimited funds. Um, and let's say, you know, you can <laughs> let's take that pressure off. And the question is what, what sort of, um, you know, commons research would you engage in, right? Kind of, kind of, a, a bit to respond to that call to action, you know? So if a, if a big yeah. foundation called you tomorrow, gave you a blank check, how would you yeah. try to address some of these, uh, you know, issues that you've kind of risen uh, for us? Yeah, I would of course uh, take the money and run. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, uh, so, so the big thing, I mean, it's, it, so what, what's been on my mind for years now is to, 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 to look into, I think to me, everything comes down to people's ability to, to, to work together. And I think that no one in this audience uh, would disagree with that. Collective action is at the core of everything we talk about, regardless of the topics that we love, that we, uh, that we are passionate about. And collective action can be spurred. You can, I mean, is there something you can do to become good at it? Is there something that you can add to the mix as an external agent to, 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 to get communities, get their act together. And that can, that can take place at, uh, in, in, in various ways. I would like to know what kinds of interventions or forms of support would, would, would allow us to get a much better view on, on working together. So, and I would, I would venture away from my discipline. I would invite, uh, I would invite psychologists or maybe uh, football coaches and, and team managers. I would go to managers work. I, I would, I would gather all sorts of empirical evidence and approaches about, uh, about working together. I think at the core of everything we do is trust and working together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. As Len said, trust is the most important resource, right? Yeah. Um, and then so Kunle was asking from the Africa uh, context, uh, he's asking you to share your thoughts about the simplification of commons complexity and addressing commons challenges in Africa, in particular regarding the use of dangerous chemicals for land clearing. So I know you've been working in Africa in the past, of course, Frank, so I'm not sure if you've engaged in that particular, you know, issue or not, but um, if you have any thoughts on how to address kind of the, the complexity, my guess is kind of referencing there all the different you know, power centers that can be involved in those issues. Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing Kunle's question now. So dangerous chemical land clearing. Yeah, this is, this is maybe also too specific for me to, mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. something clever or smart about. Oh, that's Simplif okay. Again, simplifica simplification, I mean, we all know that that's never good. So, mm -hmm. so time, place, particularities, uh, multiple scales, multiple actors, 
uh, we've been there. We know that. So simplification mm -hmm. never a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but 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 stressing that everything's complex too much might might hinder us in uh, in, in 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 our wish to solve problems. And yeah. it, it might scare us away from oh it's too complex uh, and 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 if, if you keep investing in showing how complex everything is you forget about uh, about solving uh, real life problems for real life people in real life settings so maybe there is some dual yeah so balancing that is uh, is, is difficult yeah easier said than done right <laughs> well, one, yeah. one kind of more general question as well that's come up in a couple of different contexts was just finding um, institutional support and you know funding opportunities for community-based or uh, or PAR or PAR work within policy and environmental governance generally. So I'm wondering, uh, maybe that's going to be more EU-based in your context. But if you have any ideas or recommendations, Frank, about different different groups you know around the world that are trying to fund this type of work, um, we obviously have the visiting scholar program at the workshop, and we're happy to help support that kind of thing too. But you know. Mm -hmm. You, had, you, you, had, you sit on a different perch, so if you have any recommendations there for any junior scholars in the audience, please feel free. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's super difficult. So participatory action research is the kind of research that doesn't translate in strong uh, proposals. Mm. Because basically a, a, part, a proposal, a research proposal, a proposal for, uh, for grant money based on par participatory action research is so I'll, 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 I, I, go, I, I don't read up on the topic. I have no preconceived theoretical notions. I am not sure what I'm going to do methodologically, but all I know is that I'm going to talk with people and take it from there. I mean, nobody's going to fund that. That's, that's not enough. It's too, I mean, you, there are so many things that you don't, so, so that, that is going to be very difficult, which is why you see a lot of junior scholars uh, moving to the, 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 the more fundable forms of, uh, of research that are based on uh, the generation and the testing of theory and hypothesis because there you can say i've read the literature and this is what i find and based on my understanding these are the knowledge gaps and based on my identification of knowledge gap this is my research question and these are the variables and this is how i'm going to operationalize them and this is how i'm going to 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 analyze uh, the data that i have once i have measured the indicators that I've used to to operationalize that's easy you can with your eyes closed you can write that down in a proposal and it'll get granted writing a, a proposal for participatory action research there isn't that much room for that and as I said with regard to uh, research uptake strategy types or theory of change is also a term that is used in that uh, in that sense there, there there are funders at least in Europe that are opening up to that uh, that way there that are even actively pushing for that agenda which I find very helpful. I, I, I must admit, I've been doing that kind of work. I've been organizing it uh, around these principles. It's very difficult. I, I have been, I have, I have ran into walls and I've gotten frustrated and, and, and I, uh, I've been close to giving up on it. So it's not easy, but I do think that it is necessary. Um, also transdisciplinarity, uh, policy science uh, interfaces, the working together of, of scholars with academics, the speaking of them between the two. There, there seems to be uh, more and more room for that also uh, amongst funders. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I, I'm seeing a tendency, a strong tendency of funding, at least in Europe, to move away from the classic uh, types of uh, funding cycles that are only meant to fund a PhD candidate for a number of years to allow her to collect her data and to uh, pump out the paper and then start from zero again. That's, that's, that's old fashioned, that's, that's, that's very 2019. And different world, right? Different um, world. And then uh, we don't have too much time left, so we'll just try to get through again as many of these as we can, guys. So um, Stefan was asking about the insights from your talk and how they could inform other workshops and conferences that IESC organizes to perhaps better engage commenters and practitioners around the world. So if you wanted to maybe touch on that, then we'll just do one quick final one. Yeah. No, so that's. Obviously, if you know what IAC stands for and what it has been standing for historically, you know that my story and my call is not new. Uh, so th th this organization, our association, has been a fervent proponent of, uh, of, of, of a bigger and ever-growing role of practitioners and a focus on the solving of, of problems. So this is not a new voice that I'm expressing. I'm just, 
I'm just uh, giving it a bit more voice uh, to this to this means. In various of the of the of the biannual conferences of uh, of our association, there is there is room and and, and room for for practitioners to present their cases, to smooth and talk and dialogue with uh, with with scholars. Because of course we don't understand each other uh, very well. We talk different languages. We close ourselves up in our offices while everybody else is in the field. We it's it's difficult, but if there is one organization that has consistently tried to bring two worlds together to create synergies, it's it's the association. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I I applaud uh, I applaud them for that. No, absolutely right. And maybe just a last fun one um, to kind of wind things up a little bit, Frank. So we're yeah. sitting here in 2020 at the 30th anniversary of governing the Commons, and I'm just projecting this forward to the world of 2050. All right. So as yeah. we look ahead to celebrating the 60th anniversary, what would what would success look like? you know, for you over the coming 30 years. Um, what, are, what are some more tangible metrics or what, I, I'm sure you've thought about this, right? In your reflections over the last 30 years, which of course is gonna be a big topic of conversation tomorrow morning as well. And I just love to give you, get out your crystal ball and figure out, you know, what does this yeah. look like and how can we get there? Yeah, and, and this is your idea of a quick last question. So exactly, so feel free to sum oh. that up in 30 seconds, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so tongue in cheek at the very beginning of this talk, I, I said that hopefully we wouldn't be having these uh, celebrations of governing the commons. I, 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 so, so, so a good outcome for us would, uh, would be to have forgotten about Lynn Ostrom and her book by, by then. Well, of course, we would still appreciate for what she has done, but we have moved on. And there, so, so we are solving the problems of commoners. That's, that's what we're doing. And maybe we're using part of the design principles in one way or the other. But eventually we have come to ways that allow us to provide the ingredients and the instructions and the ways to, to again, help commoners and their supporters in solving their day-to-day -day problems. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so I hope that in 20 years from now, theory building generation and the testing of theory has moved on. Because I feel that still we're struggling with IED, SES, design principles, and and we haven't solved I, I'm, I'm, yeah maybe i shouldn't go any further but but let's hope that we will have moved on in 20 years from now now the work continues in no small part thanks to your outstanding efforts and the ijc and of course the iasc you name it um so one more round of applause to frank thank you so much frank again such an excellent presentation great questions i'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get to everybody's but remember the discussion continues tomorrow morning uh, with our Governor yeah. of the Commons 30 Years Later events, which we're all really looking forward to as well. So please do get in touch um, and uh, with Frank, of course, with, uh, with us and let us know how we can be of further help. And thanks again um, to ISC. Thanks again to you, Frank, for co-sponsoring and for hosting. And this has been fantastic. And thanks to everybody for joining so, during such a turbulent time. Uh, please keep safe. Um, please be well. And uh, let's, let's keep uh, governing the commons and Frank's call to action in mind as we navigate these really you know, turbulent times. <laughs> Any final comments from you, Frank, before we sign off? No, no, a big thank you for the invitation and a big thank you to the participants who have been with us, participating, casting their votes, submitting. Uh, so, yeah, it's great, all over the world. I hope uh, you have picked up a thing or two from my talk. And if not, I hope you didn't feel like you wasted your time. It was only an hour. It wasn't that much. <laughs> so thank you. No, this is a high point. I think we all needed it. So th thank you so much, Frank. Look forward to tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> okay. Take the best nice care. Day. Cheers.